Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning. Good evening. I would like to welcome you all um, to this panel and the launch of the Prindex Second Global Report. Um, Prindex, Prindex measures global perceptions of land and property rights. And today we are here um, with this Prindex panel and invited uh, panel speakers, first of all, to launch their new global report. And secondly, going along with this report, of course, launching their new and latest data uh, from 2024 gathered in 108 countries. So what we'll be able to do today is to better understand global trends in land and housing security based on that renewed data but also to assess the evolution of this data with the previous database in 2020 and showing the evolution of property and ownership rights. But before launching the panel, I would like to come back to two small comments or two little contributions from my side. The first one is on the importance of using land perceptions to measure land in security, land security, and property rights. So I went online and looked up what is what are perceptions to better understand what we are doing here. And let me cite what Mr. Google told us. Perceptions are, the, are vital for our ability to make sense of, navigate, and interact with the world around us. It plays a crucial role in our daily lives and is essential for our survival and well-being. And what Prindex is doing by using the, the perception methodology is analyzing land rights and insecurity uh, as they are perceived. So capturing behavior across around land rights, but across many things, integrating many things, which are, for example, relationships to land, land conceptual uh, aspects, family aspects, and using the perception approach or methodology allows them to integrate that to measure land rights to new security or to new insecurity. Of course, it's not an easy task to measure perception. And we've seen from the first set of data, some of the shortcomings, some of the criticism, as it depends on many things and many things that are often not measurable. But as the panel will show today, the methodology, methodology evolves, the data evolves, the data is getting better, and we are learning over time. And you will see from the data presented today how this evolves and how this gets um, more solid over time. The second point is the importance of the Prindex data overall. It complements very well other type of data around land, such as land administration data, such as uh, the censuses and the li uh, livelihood, the household uh, surveys, um, but which are all more static and, and less contextual. So bringing together all these different uh, databases will give us the opportunity to become or to give a more holistic and complete image of land and, and property rights. It's also important because these other data sources have as Prindex itself, also their shortcomings. Some are rare, census are done only 10 years if they done at all, some are outdated, some have questionable uh, quality uh, of data. Um, and so bringing together these various data sources and the various methodologies allows us not to, not only to give us a more holistic, a more systemic uh, image of land rights, but also to complement and to overcome the shortcomings of these various databases. An example is the SDGs. We know that the state reporting or the government reporting to these, these, in, in, um, these targets and goals is very scattered. Um, in this way, for example, Prindex could be an alternative database complementing um, these, these data sources. Also, data um, Prindex allows us to bring to the fore as is shown with this 2024 um, database, more regular and more uh, time-based um, data around land. And as such, uh, 
provides us data and an, yeah, provides us data to track evolution, but also allows us now, and this we will see from the panel as well, causal relationships, which are important for policy de development and responses to today to today's um, evolutions around tenure and around land security and insecurity. This being said, on the agenda, we'll um, <clears throat> of course have a first presentation of the global report, and this will be given by Anna, Anna Locke, who is the co-director of, of Prindex. Then we will go to uh, a first keynote given by Esther Perunia. Esther Perunia, who is the director, uh, the secretary general, uh, sorry, of AFA, the Asian uh, Farmers Association. After a, a short Q and A session, we will then go to a second um, a keynote speaker. Uh, this will be given, or keynote, this will be given by Ushundu uh, Shigbu, who is an associate professor in land administration at the Department of Land and Property Science of the Namibia University of Science and Te Technology. He's based in, in Wintook. These two keynote speakers are recorded presentations and will be shown to you um, uh, online. And then we will go to a Q&A session um, the Q&A session will be online, so all of you who want to post questions to, to the panel or to the keynote, please put your uh, questions uh, in the Q&A link of, of, of Zoom, and please do not forget um, to introduce yourself and your institution so that we know who we are talking to. This being said, Anna? The floor is yours. I'm sure everybody is waiting for this big moment four years later um, to see how land rights and property rights uh, and the security and insecurity along with it is evolving. Anna, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Ward. And yes, it feels like it's been a long time coming, um, you know, both uh, for everyone out there, but for the team as well that's been working on it all the, you know, really hard over the last four years. Um, I wanted to just say thank you so much for joining us today, those of you in the room with us in Rome. Um, we know that it's a very busy schedule this week, so thank you for making the time and to the um, you know several hundred people online that have joined us around the world. Uh, thank you very much. You know, particularly we know that there are people who have had to go to, uh, or not had to go, chosen to go to the um, the, the the COP in in Cali in Colombia working very hard on environmental sustainability and we thank you for joining and and for everyone else around the world. Um, before I talk to you about Prindex, you know where we've come from, um, what our findings tell us, I wanted to introduce a, a video which is actually very personal to me. Um, it tells the story of a tiny but fiercely determined woman called. Um, Savati Bay in India, who I met last year when I was at the India Land and Development Conference. And I feel like her story really captures how transformative it can be when people feel secure on their land, in their homes. Um, so please join me in um, watching this short um, animated video of, of Savati's story. Thank you. What does home mean to you? How much of your success, health or well-being relies on knowing your home is secure? What if you felt as if any day now, your home could be taken away? Sevati Bai's life was full of uncertainty. As an informal brick-in laborer, she was struggling to support her family. The land where Sevati Bai lives has been in her family for three generations, but her name is missing from the land title. Her lack of secure land rights makes her more vulnerable to eviction and means she is unable to access credit to farm the land productively, trapping her in a cycle of poverty. The risks that Sevati Bai faces are startlingly widespread. Prindex's new report finds that over 1 billion people worldwide live with uncertainty about their property rights. In some countries, women face greater challenges in owning, inheriting and making decisions over their land due to legal barriers and social norms, limiting their economic opportunities and resilience. Through changes in laws and practices, we can change this reality. 
With the help of local organizations, Sevati Bai's life was transformed. Her family's land title was amended to include her name. Today, she is a proud farmer, cultivating her land, growing crops, and investing in her family's future. Sevati Bai is now a beacon of hope for her community, having gained something even more valuable than the income from her land her autonomy, freedom, and dignity. Research shows that when women feel secure in their homes and land, their decision-making power grows, influencing financial decisions like investing in education, health, and nutrition, so the whole family can flourish. The Printex data gives policymakers the opportunity to track the proportion of people who feel secure about their land and property, empowering governments with the knowledge they need to take action when drafting national policy land reforms. The global tracking of the security of property rights by Prindex and other organizations is a key step to monitor changes and achieve global goals of poverty reduction and secure land and property rights for all. Join us in creating more equitable opportunities for all people to thrive. Visit www.prindex.net to learn more. Thanks very much. And um, as I take you into the presentation, I did want to say a big thank you to um, first to our funder, the European Commission, and um, to Etienne Quayette in, in, um, in particular, who has championed the role of, of data and good quality evidence in strengthening land and property rights and Prindex's unique role um, within this and our contribution, we hope, um, to this. And thank you also, um, Marianne, I wonder if we could have the presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you all to um, also to our partners in the EC Data Partnership. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to organize this, this launch without the, the land portal, without the International Land Coalition and, and IFAD, which is hosting us. Um, and I also wanted to uh, do a big shout out to our research partner um, in, in Prindex, which is the, the Kiev School for Economics. Um, and just also to, you know, to highlight that they've been working incredibly hard to help us with our analysis um, over, over the last four months, often in very, very difficult circumstances. A lot of them are still based in Ukraine. And I just, you know, I just wanted to, um, to say how much we've appreciated that. So um, just thinking about, you know, what most of you attending this webinar are hoping to get out of it. Um, I think... I think most of you are attending this webinar because you know how important land tenure security and and, um, and housing security is for social and economic development, environmental sustainability, and actually, uh, you know, deep down, just our psychological well-being. Um, but before we had the first global data set that we published in 2020, we didn't actually know how many people felt insecure around the world. Um, and that made it hard to know what resources were needed to improve the situation, to be able to make informed policy and program design decisions, um, or to know whether those pro policies and programs were actually having the desired effect. And one of the big problems we faced actually as researchers and decision makers or advisors on um, to policymakers was that there was no single measure of tenure security. Um, in the past, documentation um, was assumed to be like the major indicator of tenure security, but we know that the two can't always be equated. Um, and we came in, you know, with a with a vision that we really wanted to provide good quality evidence to strengthen tenure security for for everybody around the world, um, and to provide that evidence for policies and programs. But also, increasingly, we're realizing for um, for governments and agencies to be able to respond to, to shocks that, uh, that come out of nowhere. And our starting point is to provide comparable, actionable land, you know, data on land and property rights um, and on, on tenure security around the world. And that's available on, on Prindex.net, Land Portal also um, publishes our, our analysis. And um, by providing this, we want to enable stakeholders to raise the profile of land and property rights, get it to the top of the agenda and, and keep those rights at the top, top of the agenda, 
you know, globally, and also to make sure that those issues are reflected across different development agendas. We know that land and property rights or, um, can underpin uh, a, a large range of, of social, economic, and environmental development issues. And ultimately, you know, this information can enable states to take concerted action to improve tenure security for their citizens by implementing or designing national policies and programs to address drivers of tenure and security, and then to monitor the impact of those policies and programs. And we want to make our data available to, to contribute to tracking those global, global goals that, that Ward mentioned, the, the sustainable development goals, and we've got the voluntary guidelines on governance of tenure. Um, and you know, that's, that's where we're hoping we can contribute as well. So let me just talk you through why, why we started, um, how we got to this vision and how we are now able to present the results of two rounds of, of global data on, on tenure security. And maybe through this discussion as well, so shed light on why you know, the team has, has so dedicated a large proportion of our sort of collective professional lives over the last five to 10 years to, to this, why we think that this is such an important thing to, to work on. Um, we started 10 years ago in 2015. We started to be able to respond to the need for accessible, affordable data on tenure security globally. And that was actually triggered by the success of incorporating land-related indicators in the, in the sustainable development goals. And there are some people here in, in the room and online who really made that, that possible. Um, and we also were driven by a model of international scorecard diplomacy. So thinking about um, how, when you shine the spotlight on, on how countries are performing, that that actually creates sort of a um, momentum and certain peer pressure for other countries to say, they're, they're doing really well, we should do that, or we're doing quite badly compared to the others, let's, let's ramp it up a bit. And um, with the support of Amidyar Network and the UK government, we, we started by figuring out the best way to, to measure tenure security. So that's really the first three or four years of, of, of Prindex when we, um, we developed a, a module with um, help from a lot of experts in this field to think about how best to ask the question about tenure security, how to measure it, how to structure the survey. Um, and we tested that in three pilots. And then once we were confident that we had a tried and tested methodology, we scaled up. We, we first collected data in 33 countries, and then we partnered with, with Gallup and put our module into the Gallup World Poll, and um, they collected data on our behalf in 107 countries. So when we talk about 2020, our first round, we're talking about the 140 countries together that uh, of data that was collected from 2018, 2019. Um, and then we had our launch then. We've, following that, we've done a, done a series of, of um, of deeper dives, looking at, at regional results in more detail, looking at particular countries, so Colombia, Brazil, Burkina Faso, Egypt. Um, and we also use this large data set, um, you know, hundreds and thousands of data points to look at the link between tenure security and things like gender equality and conflict and violence or urban tenure. Um, and certainly, in my time as a researcher on land issues, I'd never seen it possible to do that sort of analysis at that scale. Um, and what we have seen over the, the last five years is there has been a real demand for our data. It's been very heartening. We've had, you know, we've seen it used by development partners um, in journal articles, uh, linking tenure security to things like, like health, actually, which we would not have expected. Um, and PhD students writing to us saying, we used your data, um, you know, I used my, your data to, to do my PhD. So all of this, I think, you know, for, for us as a team has been incredibly rewarding. Um, 
And then the last, um, the last few years really has been about renewing our data and, and monitoring the changes. So with the support from the European Commission, we've been able to repeat data collection, not for the whole 140 countries, but for 108 countries. Um, and that's enabled us to monitor changes that have happened since the, the first round. Um, a few just a few details on our methodology um, for those of, of you who are interested, um, but please do go and visit our um, our website, printex.net, uh, where you can get more detail on this. You can download the questionnaire. Uh, but just to, to you know to highlight that in 108 countries, we did um, randomly selected interviews of nearly 108,000 people as part of the Gallup World Poll. Again, Gallup is our major partner in data collection. Um, and we use the question on how likely or unlikely it is that um, you could lose access to your property or part of the property in, in the next five years. And critically, that it's losing the right to use this property against your will. So we're talking about people who want to stay in their homes on their land, um, but feel that they can't. So let me take you to the part that I know Ward is very excited about, um, <laughs> probably everyone has been waiting for, of what our results actually say. And I would love to be here saying that, you know, we're moving in the right direction with the SDGs, that we are moving towards tenure security for all. In reality, um, things have got worse in the 108 countries that we reviewed since 2020. Um, in 2020, those 108 countries, 19%. So nearly one in five people felt insecure. Now nearly one in four people um, uh, feel insecure about being able to stay on their land or in their home. And this translates into a staggering figure. I mean, I've seen this figure a lot because we've been working on the report, doing the analysis, um, obviously thinking about the presentation. But that means that um, 1.1 billion people in those 108 countries feel insecure. They think that they might lose their homes or lose their land over the next five, five years. And that's an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary number to, to think about. And unfortunately, as you can see, it's also gone up from our 2020 round. If we look at where that insecurity lies, um, we can see that there are certain regions where the, the levels are highest. Um, the one that tops the charts in some ways, if you could say that, is the Middle East and North Africa, 29%, uh, um, followed by Sub-Saharan Africa um, and East Asia and Pacific. And we can see also that low-income countries are the ones that suffer most from tenure insecurity. But I would also highlight that just being in a high-income country does not mean that you escape. You can see that upper middle income countries um, have above average levels of tenure and security. And I just wanted to highlight the, the top three countries um, where, or the, I, I hesitate to say the worst performers, but in a sense, these are where, you know, some real, real issues are aligned. Philippines, Iran, and, and Jordan, where in the Philippines, you have more than one in two people that feel insecure about their, their uh, land and property. And as Ward said, we're going to hear from Esther from the Asian Farmers Association. Esther is a, a farmer herself based in the Philippines. And um, she's going to tell us some of the stories that are happening um, in, her, in her home country. This rather daunting um, diagram, bear with me though, is, uh, shows how tenure insecurity has changed since 2020. Um, and, and actually, if you look above the red line, that shows where um, the situation has worsened since 2020 significantly. Below the green line shows where things have improved. And above the, the line, uh, the largest increases in insecurity come in Ukraine, which has increased by 23 percentage points since 2020. Um, I think that that's fairly self-explanatory with the conflict in um, Malawi and Mozambique, um, and in Greece. And below the line, we have the largest decreases in Burkina Faso and in um, Tunisia. 
And one of the things that comes out, um, certainly when we've been discussing this in the team, is that the magnitude of these changes tell us that tenure security levels can, can change quite dramatically over five years. We weren't sure that they were going to, to be honest, because change takes a long time um, you know, to, to actually get change in um, laws and, and um, regulations to see those changes translate into changes on the, on the ground. But actually, we've been reminded by how quickly those changes can happen and how dramatic they can be, which indicates to us that it is really important to monitor this regularly. We also looked at why people um, felt insecure. And we have a set of, um, of, of reasons that we ask respondents, which, which came out through our pilots. You know, are you worried because you might, um, you know, the owner or renter may ask you to leave or you'll have an argument with um, family or relatives. Uh, companies or government may seize this property. Um, one reason came out very strongly in this round and much more strongly than in the last round, which was that of financial insecurity. People uh, being concerned that they wouldn't have enough money or other resources to be able to uh, live in their, their homes or on their land. And that reason was um, dominant, particularly in 38 countries. In 2020, that was, that was 24 countries. So that's gone up. We also looked at who is insecure. And we looked at that from the point of view of, of forms of tenure. So whether you're an owner or a renter. And we think that changes in insecurity may have also been driven by changes in the form of tenure. So owners tend to feel more secure than other forms of tenure in general. Renters tend to feel more, you know, most insecure. And we can see that over time, the proportion of owners has gone down since our last um, data collection. The proportion of people renting has increased. And we just wanted to highlight that um, the largest rental markets or some of the largest rental markets are, are concentrated in the Middle East. And that may account for the result that we saw that, um, that the MENA region has the highest levels of, of tenure and security. We also looked at differences um, between how secure uh, men and women feel about the ability to stay in their homes and on their lands. And, and our methodology allows us to do that because we randomly select individuals in the household. We make sure that that is um, sort of uh, equitably distributed between men and women so that we can capture those those differences. And we we can see some quite stark differences across regions, across countries, um, and across different indicators in terms of um, the the proportion of men and the proportion of women who own their property versus being you know renting it or having to stay with family family members or their perceptions of the security associated with each form of tenure. And I just wanted to highlight as well that we, we are going to be bringing out a more in-depth analysis of gender differences in a couple of a couple of months. But we wanted to give you an example of how men and women's answers are different uh, when they're asked about being able to stay in their homes or on their land if they were to become divorced from their spouse. And this sheds light on, on the state of family law in, in particular countries or social norms. And what did we find? I mean, we found that women feel most insecure um, in sub-Saharan Africa in that, in that case. Um, and there is a large difference between uh, men's and women's perceptions. We also found, um, sorry, that South Asia and the Middle East and North Africa had, had um, high rates for, for women. Um, in the case of South Asia, that's gone up from 2020 to 24. The biggest difference is in the MENA region, um, which indicates that it, it would be good to look at the status in, of, of women's um, access to assets after, after divorce uh, in that region and, and also just look at, look at drivers of insecurity. And the largest gaps where women are more insecure than men are in Yemen, in the Republic of Congo, Zimbabwe, and, and Palestine. And finally, just wanted to talk about income inequality and tenure insecurity, because we, we saw at the beginning of the presentation or the beginning of the findings that uh, 
tenure insecurity is most concentrated or most prevalent in low-income countries. Um, but actually, in low-income countries, we can see that, as you know, as my colleague Dennis said, that everyone is is fairly equal in their misery. But what we see when that's striking for us in high-income countries is not only that there is a big gap between those people who feel that they they have you know enough income to get by, or they're living comfortably, and those who are finding it difficult. Um, but there's uh, that gap is rising. Um, it was 27 percentage points in in uh, sorry 21 percentage point difference in 2020. That's gone up by seven um, percentage points. So what is next for us as a land community? You know how can how can we use this data? Um, just to emphasize again, this data is available on Prindex.net. It's publicly available. Just call on us if you have problems accessing it, but we would encourage you to go there and download the data and, and get to know it. Um, we would also really call on national governments to use this data to inform um, their policies and programs, look at whether they need to redesign them, look at whether they're being implemented um, correctly, and to use that you know, to, to make sure that they are reporting on progress um, internationally. And we'd also love to see um, development partners and the international community uh, directing resources to address the issues. Uh, we feel that our data shows that this is, this is a, a, a very um, strong, very um, difficult situation, and resources need to, to be directed at that in proportion to the scale of the, of the problem. And use the data, or even just use our methodology, um, to think about designing programs, um, to think about monitoring your programs. Thank you very much. That is all from me, and I'm going to um, hand back to Ward and the next stage of our agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, thank you for giving us this overview, even though it is rather dire. Um, let's continue uh, with the agenda, and um, we call now um, uh, to put up another little movie where Esther Perunia the executive secretary of AFA, the Asian Farmers Association, will give us uh, a keynote presentation. Um, I think the choice of Esther here as, as part of this panel is very opportune um, because as Anna have shown, the Philippines is the country that is um, showing the, the, the worst results. Uh, just to remind you the data, 56% of the adult population feels insecure. So more than one out of two uh, adults in the Philippines um, thinks he or she might lose her land or her uh, property housing uh, in the next five years. So Esther, let's launch uh, her presentation. Hello, good afternoon. And thank you, Anna. And it is a pleasure to speak at the launch of Prindex an initiative that reveals the threats that farmers, fisher folks, forest user groups, and pastoralists feel are hanging over our land and homes. Since AFA was established 22 years ago, rights to lands, waters, forests, and seeds, our natural basis of production, processing, and marketing have been a cornerstone of our unity. Land is life. With land, waters, and forests, we can have food, fiber, shelter, feeds, medicines, livelihoods. We can feel security. We can exercise our responsibility to co-create and co-produce with nature for the common good. I have seen how tenure insecurity can cause anxieties to people's livelihoods, identities, and well-being. In the Philippines, 150 households of small-scale fisher folks in the beautiful island of Marihangin, Bugsok Islands, are threatened to be evicted from their homelands, kitchen gardens, and seaweed farms by one of the biggest food conglomerates in the Philippines. Since four months ago, armed men and come into their island and have not gone since, making them sleepless the men anxious whenever they go 
have to go out fishing, creating an peace in their hearts as they wonder where will they go, how will they earn, where will their children study, what is their future if ever they are evicted from their ancestral lands. What I really value from Pindex is that it captures how people feel about their ability to stay on their land and in their homes. For farmers, this affects the way we treat the land and the relationship we form with it. If we believe that we will be able to stay on our lands, we can farm our lands in a way that preserves it for our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, giving them the security and the sense of great responsibility and rewards in sustaining and preserving the resources of land. Our members know the power of having secured land rights. As a case in point, another indigenous people's group, also from the Philippines, faced the same adversary in their struggle to reclaim 144 hectares of ancestral lands. After two decades of struggle, doing land occupation, hunger strike, pickets at the agrarian office, negotiations with government and influentials, and a 1,200-kilometer march from their village to the seat of power in the government in the capital, they won. They were able to get their lands back. And now, 16 years after winning, the cooperative that they have formed is a viable, earning cooperative involved in short-term value chains of organically produced crops and with a vibrant young farmers group. Prindex gives a signal about what could lie around this corner and what needs to be done so that farmers, fisher folk, pastoralists can feel that sense of security. It can arm us as representatives and voices of family farmers with information that we can use to discuss these issues with government and share with others suffering from the same problems. It will add fire to our bellies so that we remain dedicated to the cause of redistributive land and agrarian reforms until every farmer's rights to lands have been respected. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And I think that this little intervention of, of Esther um, shows us very well why measuring land security or insecurity is important. Um, we are now joined here um, on the panel by one of the co-authors uh, of the report. This is uh, Denis Nizalov. Denis is a senior land governance advisor for Prindex and uh, is supporting with research and country engagement on land tenure security for, for, for the Prindex uh, initiative. Um, welcome, Dennis. Let me ask you um, a couple of questions, um, Dennis and, and Anna, to, to open up this first part of, of, um, of, of our event. The first question, Dennis, uh, will be for you. Um, can you explain a bit how does financial instability, how does conflict and how does displacement exacerbate land insecurity? And can you dig a little bit deeper uh, in, in how the financial instability issue is affecting uh, land rights? And in our case, we've seen land in insecurity in, in some of the middle and higher income countries. Thank you very much for, for introducing me. Um, well, uh, for us, it was a big surprise indeed to uh, see that the focus of the sources for insecurity is really shifting from the question of stronger titles, prevented evictions, to financial sources for, uh, of insecurity. As Anna has presented, uh, we see a larger and larger number of countries where financial sources of insecurity become the major uh, threat to security of property rights for land and housing. And, uh, well, unfortunately, we don't have data to trace it many years back, 
uh, but from what we understand now about the source of insecurity, it started with the financial crisis of 2008 with uh, a huge increase in the number of mortgages with the expansion of the rental market so that people uh, have to budget in uh, the significant amount of money to pay for the mortgages and for the uh, rented accommodations. And with the ongoing housing affordability crisis, we see that more and more people have to actually rely on the rental market. So uh, this data confirms what uh, the trend that was already established in sort of policy debate about housing affordability. We provide evidence that uh, taking care about ability of individuals to stay in their homes or on their land, even though they may face some uh, temporarily difficulties with payments is important. So we have to pay uh, more attention to making housing affordable. We have to incorporate into design of social protection net, uh, networks, ability to support people who uh, otherwise would be evicted due to temporary difficulties in, and so on. Uh, regarding the conflicts, uh, well, unfortunately, over the last five years, we see several new and ongoing conflicts, which not only destroy property of uh, those uh, individuals who uh, live in the war affected areas, but also that increases a number of people who have to move to safer places. So we have larger, a larger number of people who are displaced. And well, uh, with the war in Ukraine, we see that many Ukrainians move to Europe, and that's the higher income countries where we see uh, the increase in insecurity because we have a large number of people who enter rental market. And in Ukraine itself, the number that uh, Anna has mentioned increase in insecurity by about 23 percentage points. That roughly corresponds to the share of population that was displaced. It is roughly corresponds to the share of territory that was occupied. So I think we are able to provide evidence and justify the need for police intervention with hard numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Anna, let me, let me come to you. Can you give us a bit more information on how Prindex covers community land uh, and how data and, and the results of this data um, are depicting security and insecurity on, on collective land rights? Thank you, Ward. I've, um, this is a really good question because it's something that we've been looking at with our national representative samples, which uh, don't capture community land at a level that allows it to be representative. Um, so we might have in some countries, you know, for example, in Latin America, one or two members of um, collective tenure systems of uh, indigenous people that are representative. So that's not enough to draw conclusions from. So one of the things that we've been doing, um, working with, with the International Land Coalition, actually working with, with FAO and Forest Peoples Program, is to develop a methodology that is more appropriate for assessing collective tenure. So asking communities how they feel about their community's ability to stay on land. And as we speak, actually, I know that some of our colleagues in ILC are in Colombia um, talking about you know whether we this can be in, included as an indicator in the global biodiversity framework and the set of targets and um, the co-director of of Prindex Malcolm Childress is is also out there looking at that. So you can adapt it. Um, we're also looking at pastoral tenure um, so that we can represent these these actually traditionally underrepresented marginalized communities and bring you know raise their profile in. In you know national debates regionally and the global debates in these um, you know in the, in the biodiversity conference and the climate conferences. Thank you, Dennis. Do you want to complement that? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, well with respect to your question about the community uh, land and several other arrangements that we see in different parts of the world, uh, a Prindex is first and unique source that really shows how tenure 
forms are distributed at national levels and globally. And uh, uh, by doing that, we see that uh, roughly 50% of global population associate themselves uh, with ownership for their land and, and housing, so their owners, while about 15%, uh, uh, as uh, Hannah has uh, shown on her slide, are renters. Uh, we have more than 35% of people who are using family-owned property, but 8% of population include all other forms of tenure, include, uh, including the use of communal land. So from um, Prindex, what we have learned is that there are several important uh, tenure arrangements that are really underrepresented. And as Anna has mentioned, uh, Prindex team has uh, implemented pilots in uh, Nigeria with uh, uh, slum communities, in Colombia with, uh, uh, with community land communities, we can see that Prindex methodology can capture the dynamics uh, of uh, use of property, the security of rights in such communities. However, these projects would have to be really designed uh, specifically for that environment. And I'm back to you. Um, can you give any information, details on, on what next? Yeah, um, I think in terms of what next, we, we will be digging deeper into, into the results. So we'll be doing a series of, of regional analysis and doing launches um, at regional level. So we will have something in January for West Africa. Um, as I mentioned, we will be looking at the gender differences um, in insecurity, and I can I can tell you as a little bit of a teaser that we're starting to throw up some um, unusual results. So, you know, I'd like to emphasize we are looking at gender differences. We're not just looking at women's land and property rights, and we're we're seeing that there are very different drivers of men's and women's insecurity. That actually both of those need to be acknowledged and addressed in in government policy. Um, we would really love to use this two-point data set for, for, um, for countries, you know, over time to also, again, dig deeper into the link between tenure security and, and conflict and violence and different themes that are, are, are out there. Um, so just, just more and more analysis, more um, dissemination, more engagement. Um, we're just looking forward to, to talking to everyone and also really thinking about interpreting those results at, at country level. Our first question that's always asked of us is, but why in my country, why do we have this level of, of insecurity? And our data enables us to start that conversation to shed some light on it. Um, but we really love talking to the experts in those countries to understand changes in policies and, and regulations that may have driven those changes or things that are, are really underlying those, um, those high levels of insecurity or low levels of insecurity that can give us good models in terms of institutional arrangements and belief or trust in government that, that really enable people to feel more secure in their, in their homes and on their land. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Dennis. Let us go to the to the next point on the agenda, and we'll have again a pre-recorded message um, from uh, Professor Uchendu Chibu. Um, again, we'll 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 emphasize more how how the data can drive evidence-based policies and and strategies uh, to reduce global to new insecurity. So more here presentation on 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 the data itself and what the data can achieve. Hello, everyone, and greetings. Um, my name is Uchen Eugene Chibu. I'm a professor in land administration at the Namibia University of Science and Technology in Vinduk. I'm the coordinator of the Network of Excellence on Land Governance within the Southern African region. I also happen to be the co-chair of the research cluster of the Global Land 2 Network, hosted at the UN Habitat. I would, like to I would like to start by congratulating the Prindex team and all partners that have made the release of this Prindex report a reality. As an individual working in the land sector, I am very happy that the report is out for all of us to use. Especially, it will be a handy tool for academics like myself, researchers like myself, pol policymakers, 
practitioners, as well as communities that have evolved into making direct land governance decisions. I particularly welcome this report in Africa where everyone knows, obviously, that we have our share of land data challenges. Some of these challenges cut across sectors and across special units. For instance, there's the youth problem. The youth issues persist in Africa because of a lack of accurate data concerning their land ownership, land rights, and land use situations. Local authorities in Africa lack information systems that can cater to the needs of the African youth. Also, land information pursuing the agenda for growing cities in Africa remain a critical data infrastructural challenge. And this report presents a baseline for operationalizing or at least adopting and making decisions that are based on data. All of these make tenor security a legal, social, as well as environmental issue in the continent. It makes it a socioeconomic concern within the development dynamics of the continent as well. But the report provides a platform for Africans to develop a common framework for tracking progress on land tenure security. It also presents a platform for monitoring land governance issues. These have been big problems and the report obviously provides opportunities for using data to make decisions within the continent. Having read this report, it provides the insight into the causes of various forms of land and property rights and securities that exist here. It also gives a peek into how to provide or improve these various challenges through appropriate land tenure policies, governance decisions, as well as individual or group actions. I believe the Prindex report provides a baseline as well for the Global Land Indicators Initiatives, an initiative of the Global Land Tool Network. This particular initiative focuses on indicators necessary for achieving aspects of the SDGs. For instance, the documentation of land rights has a focus on percentage of women and men with legally recognized documentation or evidence of security, uh, secure rights to land. On the aspect of perceived tenure security, it looks at the percentage of women and men who perceive their rights to land to be protected against dispossession or eviction. There are various other indicators, but the Prindex report speaks directly to these indicators and provides real data on which these indicators can be judged and monitored. These indicators particularly speak to the SDGs, SDG 1, 2, 5, 11, 15, and 16. I wish I could have joined the launch of this particular report, but unfortunately, or fortunately, I also happen to be currently in the United Nations Geospatial Knowledge and Innovation Week in Deakin, China. The discussions at the Geospatial Week have been around the positive of land and tenure security data globally, and Africa has been a big mention. But I have also taken the opportunity to mention the Prindex report here, and I'm hopeful that everyone would embrace the report and use it as a baseline for the work we all do in the land sector. Once again, I would like to thank the Prindex team for this very insightful report. Thanks very much. Perfect. This little intervention here showed us very well how this data speaks to other data sets, to other indicators, to global frameworks like the SDGs, etc. So um, re-emphasizing what we said in the beginning of this, this presentation. Um, let us come to a Q&A and, and open the floor uh, for questions. So as I said in the beginning, I invite everybody to put um, your questions in the, in the Q&A on, in, on the Zoom link. We received already uh, quite some questions, but, but let them come. Even if we cannot respond to them today, this will feed the, the reflections and the, 
and and shape the messages coming out of the report and and, and next uh, coming um, presentations of the data. So please let them come. Dennis, the first question we received, I think, concerns you. Um, has been addressed already a little bit, but may be good to re-emphasize. What are the key drivers behind the increase in global tenure insecurity? Thank you. Uh, I think this is the key question about uh, the report and new data. Um, as we have mentioned several times, uh, times the financial sources of insecurity is the driving uh, force behind the increase in insecurity. However, uh, if we think a little bit deeper, what we observe globally over the last, I would say, decades already, is a strong process of urbanization, right? We uh, see increase in labor mobility. And what it means that we have more and more people who rent uh, their houses or land or where they build their uh, houses, right? So we have sort of strong increase in many countries of the rental sector. But what happens, the policies that regulate rental sector are behind, right? And uh, I think our report, our results, is a strong call for revisiting uh, policies that provide security not only to owners, but also to renters, and stimulate further development of the rental market, but also strengthen the right of those who would like to invest in the rental markets. Thanks. The second question is again for you, uh, Dennis, and coming from uh, Transparency International and concerns they land and, and corruption work in, in Africa. So they're asking um, if the Prindex data takes uh, corruption into account, and is there any data related to that in, in, the new, in the new data you just launched? Thank you. That's a very good question. I would uh, invite everybody to read our uh, report that we have just published on our newly updated website with the new data. Uh, we carefully looked at the link between tenure, insecurity, and corrup uh, corruption, and we see a very strong relationship between these two. And uh, it not only correlation between the level of corruption and level uh, of tenure insecurity, but also it corresponds to the reasons that people quote as the sources of insecurity. So people uh, are worrying about being evicted by government. People worry about how uh, vulnerable they are to the conflicts with local authorities. And people worry about the strengths of their titles. And all of these are linked to how good the government performs at the local and national level. So we also tried several other measures of quality of governance where we clearly see a link between the quality of governance and security of property rights. And yeah, as Dennis uh, mentioned, these correlations are um, presented in, in, in the report. Anna, uh, let's come to you. How you, uh, you've mentioned several times um, that government should uptake, et cetera, the data for, for informing policy. But can you give us a bit uh, more details on how this data has been um, shared with governments? How is, has this information been shared and, and, and reached governments? Thanks, Ward. I think we, um, we do this in, a, in, in different ways. I mean, we use existing platforms, um, conferences, convenings, um, we have some direct relationships with, with governments where we share this data. Um, but maybe an example that, or two examples I can, I can identify. One is Dennis was um, with the Working Party on Land Administration with the UNECE, um, with senior land administration officials, giving them a sneak preview of the, of the results in, in their countries. They really um, were very interested in this. Now, there's there's a question here about the uh, the extent to to which land um, land administration officials can influence the rest of the government. So we have to think about that very carefully because we also need to be targeting um, members of the, you know or government officials in the ministries of finance, um, ministries of you know uh, finance and planning. Um, and to be able to emphasize to them what the importance of security is so that 
they allocate the resources that are needed for land administration officials. So that's one, one thing. Um, also, so that, you know, other regional groupings, we were going to be having an event with the, the West African Economic Commission early next year, again, to be, be um, disseminating our information to government officials. So a combination of the, those sort of wider convenings, um, sort of targeted relationships that we have with governments that we, um, you know, we, we think uh, and have demonstrated that they're, they're very interested in this and very responsive. I think one of the issues as well is in the international reporting on the SDGs. There are some countries who are um, struggling with reporting using their own, own data and are interested in using um, sort of, uh, non-official or, or sort of complementary um, sources of data. So that's, um, you know, the, the, these are the different avenues that we're, that we're exploring. Thank you. Uh, another question here from somebody who who wants to play the devil's advocate. Um, the person is asking, why should development partners devote funding to land sector work versus funding social safeguards and or supporting economic growth to address drivers of insecurity more broadly? Actually, that's a, a perfect question because I think we would argue that you do actually need to have those resources allocated across the board because something that our data shows that maybe more traditional land-focused um, data or land sector-focused data shows is that the drivers of insecurity do you know can lie outside of the land sector. If you're looking at economic sources, financial sources of insecurity, as Dennis was saying, you need to be looking at, at rental market policies. You need to be looking at your, your financial policies that are, are dictating the cost of mortgages. Um, so, and, and you need to be looking at things like trust in government because as you were saying right at the start, Ward, we're talking about perceptions which may not be always aligned with objective reality. Um, and those perceptions, those subjective opinions drive people's behavior. If they believe that the government is not on their side and is not going to enforce their rights, that will really um, you know, drive them to not invest in their land, not invest in their property. So there is, a, yeah, there are a wide set of, um, of policy measures that need to be taken that, that don't necessarily um, reside in traditional land administration. And for example, titling, you know, in some areas, obviously that those activities are really important still in terms of driving in uh, security or greater security in others, there may be other actions that are more, um, you know, are more relevant. And that also, I think, speaks to the fact that we need to be seeing land integrated into those broader development and economic policies much more integrated than they are currently. Thank you. Perfect. I'm getting more questions here, but I, I can see the time. We, we over six o'clock. Um, so we will stop it here. We will keep your questions. And as I said, they will feed um, further reflection and um, of the team in presenting uh, the reports and, and the data in the future. So let me just conclude here by, by first of all, um, give you my takeaways of, of, of this, this, this lounge. I'll do this in, in five short points. The first one, as we've seen, uh, Anna, you've presented it well, is that the land and property rights situation in the world globally, according to the data that you've just launched, is getting worse. It's now 1.1 uh, billion adults that are affected or that perceive their tenure, their tenure rights as insecure. This represents 23% of the population, which is an increase of four percentage uh, points. This increases proportionally and in absolute in absolute terms. Second point is that the worst regions are first of all uh, the MENA region, um, Sub-Saharan Africa region, and thirdly the East Asia and Pacific region. It affects more low-income countries, but um, high income is not a buffer against tenure insecurity. We've seen that very well in the presentations. Um, this is due to the financial instability, if I understand well. So we see many high-income households perceiving themselves as, as more insecure uh, through this uh, financial instability. But this is also related to the shift of ownership 
uh, of yeah of ownership from from um uh, having the ownership of of the, the the land or the or the housing to more rental properties which show a lower degree of security due to um, mainly legislation and then last point is the gender although the global average does not does not show it because there's extreme and evolutions in, in both directions to the negative and the positive. Um, it shows very well that women uh, land rights remain, and, and women in general remain more disadvantaged than men. Let me close this by a final call of action uh, as uh, Anna has done in her presentation as well to keep up the data work, of course, but also for the need for this data to increase its impact and to be used and, and, and to act out there uh, in order to, to feed systemic change on the ground. And I would do this in three small points. First of all, to increase the uptake. We need to increase and encourage policymakers, civil society, international organizations to use the Prindex data to inform strategies and policies aiming at improving land tenure. Secondly, is to promote. It's to promote this Prindex data and especially for especially to be integrated with other data sources and other data and indicator frameworks. The EC who is sponsoring this, this work has done that through the data initiative, combining this data, um, uh, the Prindex data, with Landex, with the land portal, with land matrix, and put all this together in a global land observatory so that all of these can talk to each other and can strengthen not only the data itself, but also how the land and land uh, security and insecurity is documented. But it's also by promoting the uptake and the positioning of this data, and Anna said it, within global frameworks and global spheres like the CBD, like UNCCD, SDGs and the VGTs. It's only then, if they are uptaken in these frameworks, that data can achieve its full potential and its impact. And then lastly, lastly is support. I think we need more of this data and we need more of this analysis. The data has shown it. There is evolution over quite a relatively small time period. Over four years, we see significant uh, variation and evolution of land rights, meaning that such exercises will need to be um, uh, repeated um, and um, done on a, on a regular basis, hence the need of uh, more data. But it's also digging deeper in some of these complex situations. Uh, Dennis mentioned it very well, improve the sample, um, but also do some deep dives in of some of these cases, whether it's uh, collective land rights or the rental markets, et cetera, et cetera. So with this, thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Anna, for um, this very interesting uh, uh, launch, but also to, to, to make this data available from now on. And I'm sure the downloads will increase from now on on the data. The platform has been launched uh, today. So the data is available. So please, um, this is a call for everybody to use the data. Um, of course, feed the policies, but also uh, the analysis. Thank you all and hope to speak to you soon. Bye-bye.